Uh, welcome everyone to uh, today's installment of the Fall Speakers series hosted by the Development Foundation Center for uh, Hellenic Studies. My name is uh, Dimitris Kralitz and I'm a director of the center and professor of uh, Byzantine history uh, in the Department of uh, Global Humanities. Uh, each year our speaker series hosts, uh, hosts scholars from uh, all over the world, but as the case may be also members of our own academic community, both students and faculty, who present on various aspects of what one might uh, broadly call uh, Hellenic studies, themes migrating from classics, history, to history of all eras, uh, whether ancient medieval or modern literature, Greek and Greek culture in general. Uh, before uh, uh, we proceed with uh, today's talk, we should note that today's event is hosted on the St. Bernabe campus on the ancient territories of the Spanish Muscarian State with the Kurgatlan uh, peoples. Uh, today's speaker is uh, Metaus, uh, fifth year. A doctoral student in SFU's uh, history department and affiliate member of the uh, SNF Center for uh, Hellenic Studies. Uh, Mete holds a BA in physics, which proves that there is a future event for people outside the humanities, in the humanities, uh, and uh, uh, a BA in physics and MA in history, both from Washington University in Istanbul, and originally came to uh, SFU with a declared interest in um, the life of uh, Byzantine Pedro, uh, not an English, but has gone uh, away. Uh, that interest is reflected in uh, many key publications, imagining present identity in uh, Middle Byzantine Arabic sources, which appeared this year in the Ravage Handbook of uh, Identity in Byzantium, and in an analysis of socio uh, economic uh, viewpoints within the writings of Texas and Anastasia Bird, and the other scope in the uh, 2020 volume of uh, uh, Passing Perfect. Uh, Mete has also presented papers. Uh, the Business Studies Conference uh, in San Antonio, but also in conference with Athens. Dealing off from the uh, purely uh, peasantry focused uh, interest, uh, Emmett turned his uh, doctoral research to Paphlagonia, the Northern Asia Minor uh, province of the medieval Roman uh, Empire, which for the past few years he's been studying what will be a regional study uh, to some degree of core periphery of what is, in a way, a core periphery. Uh, territory of uh, Romania. Uh, his uh, paper uh, today stems from, he, from his work and is titled uh, Communication and Movement Dynamics in Business in Patagonia. Now, before I pass the to Kimet, I should note that this talk uh, is recorded and streamed over uh, Zoom. So, if you have any concerns on uh, SFU's privacy policy, uh, some uh, uh, studying of uh, what SFU has online about this situation might be of interest uh, uh, to you. At the end of the talk, we take questions by both members uh, of the audience who are present here and whoever uh, is joining us uh, online. So if you want to participate online, please uh, put any questions or comments you might have uh, either in the chat box or in the question and answer, answer box, and I will try to relate those to, to me. Without further ado. Thank you for the introduction, Dimitri, and thank you all for tuning in. So today I will be discussing communication and movement dynamics in Catalonia. And before I begin, I thought I would briefly introduce GIS software. Uh, so here I have two definitions of it, just firstly the initial Wikipedia definition. So GIS is a type of database containing geographic data that is descriptions of phenomena for which location is relevant, combined with software tools for managing, analyzing, and visualizing those data. So if I have to explain it on a way, my own definition would be, GIS software provides a uniform coordinate system into which different data sets can be mapped and imported and overlapped and also into which coordinate base, that is latitude, longitude, and elevation data, are manually added. So the software basically serves to bring all this data together into a mapping system. Now, a small disclaimer, the maps I used here are created quickly, so they're not publication ready. They are meant to not represent the final possible products of uh, QGIS, but sort of how they may be utilized. So it's sort of a work of progress. So here are just some example maps Uh, the Köppen climate index at one kilometer resolution. Different roadmaps, which I will definitely get into. So, uh, my dissertation consists of four chapters. In this talk, I will be kind of looking at select sections of two of my chapters, which kind of focus on the issues of communication and movement. Uh, so, it's definitely a work in progress, and I will be only be able to, due to time uh, shortage, 
presenting short sections of the so, so examples. So Pathogonia is an area of Northern Asia Minor, as you can see here. Now, just to show some of the main features. So what we immediately notice is this area has three cascading mountain chains in the latitudinal direction, so on the east-west axis. So the Kura Mountains, the Olgasis or Ugad Mountains, and the Kurov Mountains. And these sort of create three roughly uh, latitudinal divisions in the terrain through which major roads and thoroughfares pass. So it's an important characteristic of the landscape. Um, river mountains. Certain sections of the Halis are navigable, but um, this is, for instance, the photograph from the Halis River. And you can see these steep ridges make it, even though it is uh, you know, navigable, it's not the most suitable for transportation, as you can see from the image. Um, so just another short little uh, image. So this is the modern approach to Sinop across the Kura Mountains. And you can sort of notice how the landscape's been leveled out. And this is very near to the infamous Dranas Pass of medieval and ancient times, which was a, a kind of arduous mountain pass, which made communication and travel across here difficult, but which today, going to dynamite technology, it's, we're able to bypass it, and there is a tunnel now located here. And this is sort of how the road is going to sound. Now, this sort of shows the climate classification map of Apodonia with certain major sites indicated. I won't be going into details of this, but what I want us to notice here is how diverse the region is. So if you Look at a sort of average, this sort of sized area in a different section of the world it will be hard pressed to find the section so colorful in this current kind of climate index. It's, it's a very diverse landscape, and we have a sort of cascading change in the vegetation and climate as we head inland to the coast. For instance, this is the forest in the region of Kastama. Here we see a sort of image from the landscape around Amastris so of coast time. And then contrasting with this sharply, this for instance is an image from Chorum, the Chorum area. And we can see how different it has suddenly become in a distance which is less than 100 kilometers away from the image I showed you at the start, the forest we uh, So this is a JF edit that's showing the forest of Europe. And if we zoom in on the sort of modern Turkey, so it's the modern map, uh, we can notice that still today, Paphlagonia is one of the most densely forested regions of this area. As it was, I mean, isn't being nice. uh, So here I've mapped, not to really, so we, we don't need to really look at this in detail, but just I want us to notice that most settlements are located along a river valley, a river network. Here I've mapped them according to which network they belong to, and we will be uh, sort of utilizing this info as we go forward. So one of the main things I look at in this section of the study is the road network of Patagonia. So I have followed uh, some other scholars, such as Klaus Berke from the Tabula Imperi Byzantini, in labeling the road networks, uh, the coastal road A3, and then going south from the A2, A1, and I've added on my own A0 map road. So these are all the latitudinal main roads through Patagonia. I'll start by discussing route A3, the northern route. Now, this route is a continuous Route attested from various sources from antiquity and the Byzantine period to have existed all along the coastline, all the way to Trebizond in the far sort of eastern, northeastern Anatolia. Now, this is an arduous route. It's a very undesirable route because it follows the craggy coastline with lots of sort of uh, difficult passages, very mountainous terrain, forested, etc. So, this route was not really suitable for wheeled transportation. Uh, it's more suitable for horses and mules and donkeys rather than an ox cart, for example, which is what we more find in the inland routes. Um, so just some images from the sort of area. This is the Jide coastline from the Kitoros. Um, this is an image of the so-called columns of Udajaja. So this is located at the point where route A3 necessarily curves inland. And you can sort of see from the same why it curves inland. Uh, it would be very impossible to not go in there, basically. So it's very hard, as you can see, to imagine transportation along here 
And imagine an army passing along here, for instance, or you know, in form of like wagons and stuff. Uh, so some other images, just a sort of see the terrain, uh, Ionopolis, Nebel. So the utilization of Route A3 is linked to security of the interior. So this is something interesting. Um, because this route gains importance in times when the security of the interior is threatened, such as during the late 11th and 12th centuries of Patagonia, during the Turkmen invasion of the area. So we have a lot of literary references to large army columns utilizing this route. And you can see here I listed a few, the Lombard per se, and then campaigns of various emperors and generals. And so just imagine the route, how difficult it seems. So this is obviously only utilized in cases where necessarily had to be utilized due to the insecurity of the interior. And we don't really find many references to army, so military movement across this movie, or for instance, the 10th century, because it wasn't necessary and wasn't desired. So then we can look at, look at briefly A2. So this is the sort of intermediate route going through the center of Patagonia, the heartlands, and say, uh, this, this route once ran through the center of the Mithridatic kingdom of antiquity, and it was after the conquest of, of this kingdom by the Romans that, the, that Pompeii uh, founded a series of cities along here in lowland areas. For instance, Pompeiopolis, named after him, and then Neapolis, Magnopolis, Nicopolis, Neospolis, so all these Roman cities. And these are all formed in lowland. such as what happened during the 7th, 8th centuries with the Arab incursions period, we will notice a kind of change in landscape dynamics where these lowland sites start to become, start to decline as settlements and some of them are abandoned even in favor of more sort of fortified smaller sites in upland locations. Uh, so again, you know, this is route A1. So this is sort of the southern route uh, through the, it's quite a straight route through the center of Patagonia. This, follows roughly the fault line I showed in, in the first image, the North Anatolian fault line. It is a deep furrow created by the fault line, a deep valley. It's very suitable for transportation. Uh, there's no real alternative anyway because it's bounded by mountains on the north and south. And still today in Turkey, this is a major highway for one of the roads in the country. So just to sort of briefly utilize some details, to briefly look at some details of these routes. For instance, we can notice that Western sections of A1 are utilized even when emperors headed to campaign to Cilicia and the south and the southern areas. So not necessarily only when going on campaign to uh, Eastern Anatolia or Armenia, Great Armenia, but also when going to Cilicia. So I don't really have time to go into details of these, so I'm just sort of just going over them quickly. So uh, when emperors went on campaign across the groups, uh, at pre-designated stations, way stations, supply stations, supplies would be dropped off for the army and street planned in advance. And sources of test to several of these important locations along with A1. And you can see them here on the map. Here are these groups in sort of a broader context of the possible approaches to, to be taken when passing through here. Uh, and then finally, we have the most southern route, route A0, which passes through basically the Anatolian plateau. Now, we're not really in Patagonia anymore here, but I included it because, and I want to quote Niketa Soniantes here, when he called Ankara, which is located along A0, a Pontic city. So I think it sort of shows us how this route A0 in areas south of Patagonia cannot really be seen separate from it, and it's all sort of connected in these big networks. Now, the, the hagiography of St. Theodore of Sicyon, uh, describes, describing the early 7th century, provides some information about Route Zero. So, Sicyon is a village in the environs of Anastasio Polis, through which this route passed. And the Vita makes it abundantly clear that this A0 was an imperial post route. And furthermore, that military movements frequently happened along it, through, which is exemplified through the many, many, many examples given in the Vita. Now, uh, connecting these large latitudinal communication arteries, which I've just gone over, labeled A3 to A0, were smaller roads traversing the north to south axis. This is the harder direction of travel for a 
region in which the main mountain chains are all located in the east-west axis. Especially in winter months, these, these routes labeled here, some of them I've labeled in red, would be impossible. A letter by Michael Zelos from the 1060s illustrates the danger as well. In the letter, Zelos mentions that he repeatedly warned a young notorious, notorious not to travel to Patagonia in the winter due to the dangers inherent. Yet we find out in a later letter that the notarius ignores this advice and has to cross icy mountains with great difficulty. Xenophon describes these routes with the words, I quote, if these ridges are held, not even all the men in the world pass through. So this kind of really shows the kind of the terrain we're dealing with. This is an image from the Dardere Canyon, which is located in the Kure Mountains south of Ionapolis. So an example of one of the smaller routes you could take to traverse the north-south axis. And you see how it's not very inviting. Here are further images from the same canyon. So various, so here, to, just to give a more cake example, various itineraries indicate that a route ran from the provincial capital for much of Papagonia's history, Gangra, to Sinop. So this route necessarily had to cross over two large mountain chains. And Survey, archaeological survey groups have identified the crossing points of this route, for instance, across the Olgast Mountains. It is at around 2,000 meters, where today a ski resort is located. So just to give you an idea of sort of terrain this has to pass through. And the closest alternative route, when traveling from Gangra to scale, that you could take instead of what I've marked out here, would involve taking the Timolisa to Neon Polis connection further east. And just the distance between these two routes, about 200 kilometers, Indicates that there aren't many options and how difficult it would be if, for instance, one of these paths would explode due to weather, etc. So, here's uh, just a sort of map of the broader region so we can situate things a bit and sort of possible approaches into Byzantine territory I've marked here. Now, this slide uh, I will be skipping actually, but I want to just briefly mention that here I have mapped out certain rebellions which occurred in Macedonia from the 7th to the 12th centuries. The red ones are locations where they originated in, orange circles are rebellions which were broader but include Macedonia too. And uh, I do discuss this in my work, but it, these rebellions utilize these groups quite heavily in this region, but I will be skipping this for now. I just wanted to show the image. So, Macedonian fortresses were very important for command and control of this landscape. So the reason I've been going through all this road network is to then lead into this, what I'm gonna explain now about these fortifications. So here we see images of Boyabar Castle and Hastamon Castle. What you immediately hopefully notice is that they are located on huge rocky outcrops, elevated. So I took both of these photographs from the respective uh, towns from just below where they are located. So they're really high up and, you know, on a, yeah, big rocky outcrop. And here, for instance, is the views from Boyabat Castle. So the bottom image shows the view northwards, and you can see the huge visibility index. So how commanding the structure is of the area. The left image shows the view towards the west along the Amnias Valley. This is the view from Castamon Castle. So once again, we see an even bigger visibility index here, all the way to the Korea Mountains on the coast in the distance. Uh, so you can imagine, like, if you just try and erase the city from your view and imagine it in Byzantine times, you can imagine what a great Yeah, so this is view. And there is the stretching way today, which is cut the mall, which uh, it's, it's kind of a stretch division. So, um, <laughs> also another example is Amatia Castle. So again, once again, on the, on the right, you can see the castle itself located on a, on a, a steep ascent, and it's kind of commanding view of the Irish River Valley. So overall, with these two examples, I want to illustrate that uh, the importance of these strategic elevated positions across Patagonia. And this importance becomes even more relevant when we remember the roadmap. There are not very many alternatives to travel. And the rivers are not navigable, most of them. So this makes these locations even more strategic than they might have been in a terrain with more sort of accessible roads. Because controlling these strategic strongholds and choke points makes the area sort of, so the defense of the area depends on these in a way. 
And we will see in the 11th century, for instance, when these strongholds are solely lost, it becomes unfeasible to defend Patagonia. So another means by which these were utilized was beacon signaling. So beacon signaling is the process of lighting up beacons uh, in a succession uh, within vision of each other to convey a signal, stress signal, for instance. And recent studies in this area, especially in Eastern Patagonia and the Pontic region, have looked at certain of these structures and conducted a U-shell analysis on them to see if they are suitable for this sort of beacon and uh, signal, concluding that they are indeed suitable. So this was another sort of aspect of them being located so high up. So now uh, to sort of tie things into the broader picture. So this is the locations of military encampments and Aplecton in Patagonia. Now Aplecton were locations where the field armies would gather in preparation for campaign and where the emperor would meet them. So these, this image shows the location of Aplecton known from the 10th century group of ceremonies in red and locations known from other sources, some locations, I haven't included areas to the west, in orange. And adding some sort of elevation data and then also adding looking at the sort of climate data, we can see in this image, for instance, how the 10th century Aplecton straddled the Anatolian Plateau. And I think the climate map makes it really clear that they sort of straddled the, the sort of the other side of the Taurus Mountains on the Anatolian Plateau and how they are strategic position. So I think this map really helps to sort of understand the location of these. Now, uh, so Dazimon, today's Tokat, is the only location even remotely close to Patagonia in the 10th century which is listed as an aplecton. So why is this? Uh, so aplecton need to be in large fertile areas so that large armies can spread out, feed themselves and their horses and beasts of burden. Uh, and also it needs to be kind of close to the front line, so heading towards there. So the exigencies of the 10th century didn't necessitate uh, aplecton in Patagonia, which was at that point far away from the front line. But then the 11th century, we have Skilitsas mentioning an Aplecton in uh, Gunaria. So this area has not been identified, but it was most probably located in the Castamon plain on the Amnias Valley region. Firstly, because these are some of the few fertile plains with the ability to host such a um, Look at some examples of how these modifications are utilized in two conflict periods involving Patagonia uh, the Byzantine Arab Wars and the, then the Turkmen invasion period. <coughs> now, the Byzantine Arab Wars in Patagonia begin in the 640s. So, this is first attested for Southeast Patagonia in areas of Epaita and Amasya through mainly sources concerning Sarah and Theodore and his miracle collections. Um, and these are tested even in this sort of early date, prime early date, 640s and then 660s, etc. It really increases. We have basically annual raids, wintering raids, in fact, which come and encamp in this area to this area of southeast Patagonia. And then, but then what of the situation west of the Hellas, which was often viewed as a sort of safer area? Then we have several different sources, uh, such as Theophanes and several Arab sources mentioned Bangra being. Attacked, and, sorry, attacked several times in the early 8th century, and these were part of broader campaigns heading for the west, indicating that the sole area was becoming a area of contestation. And then um, St. Filaretos Phila, Vita, for instance, mentions Arab raiders stealing his cattle from the Amnias Valley, indicating presidency in the 8th century. And a number of other sources indicate that the picture was becoming an area of sort of contestation in Patagonia. Now, this also bred the sort of ideas of local protectors and tutelary divinities, which I will be skipping due to time of things, but I want to just put it here because I sort of tied some of these arguments into each other, where for Patagonia we have several of these important figures, the most important probably being St. Theodore. So some landscape dynamics. Uh, so it is understood that the populace who seek shelter in fortifications, many of which we have seen, during times of these raids uh, with their livestock quite often, and then descend back down when the coast was clear. Uh, this is a trend frequently also underlying military manuals. And 
This also goes hand in hand with some changing settlement patterns, which I've already alluded to. So some of the, so Pompeiopolis, for instance, is a good example of this. It was located in the Amnias Valley, which we had just uh, described was already the pocket of Arab raids, known from the Beatles and Colorettos. Uh, and archaeological evidence indicates that this area was abandoned in the 8th century for a number of nearby elevated fortified sites, including Kut Kadesi, which is very close to Pompeiopolis, located on a 750 meter rocky outcrop. So, kind of showing the change in settlement patterns. So, this downgrading in size and spreading out across fortified sites is characteristic of this period. We also see this in Hadrianopolis. Um, with, it, with a nearby fortified site of King Stena. And other examples can be given from Southeast Babylonia, such as the fortified sites of Epaita and Dazimon gaining prominence, while lowland sites such as Komana received it due to their vulnerable lowland positioning. Now, the last recorded instance of an Arab raid or war, sorry, Arab attack into Babylonia is in 863, it's known as the Battle of Poson or the Battle of Balakan. Um, so, the battle was located in a place called either Poson or Ramachon, place that has not been identified. A number of references from the text indicate that it was probably a tributary of the Hellas. And, and some other information gives it as being a strategic hill which the Byzantines occupy and are able to win the battle in this way through a topographical advantage. So, the sites in squares here are some of the sites which I have tentatively identified as possible locations where this battle may have taken place in the Hallas region. And this battle is also interesting because the, the general here, uh, Petronas, the brother of uh, Empress Theodora, was from Paphagonia. So I won't really be going into this, but it represents a sort of example of homeland defense, what I call, where Petronas, the general, is given executive command of field armies above his rank to defend Paphagonia. And it is, according to the narratives, it is his knowledge of the topographical, so knowledge of the terrain, which eventually enabled the victory according to the sources. So, so following this battle, we have a period of about 200 years where Patagonia is largely sheltered from foreign aggressions, not necessarily the, uh, internal aggression. So, from in this period, we also have the spread. So, in this period of so relative peace of Patagonia, among other reasons, obviously, there is the rise of private landed estates across Asia Minor. And for Paphagonia, the families of the Pomnenos and Lucas uh, emerge as some of the two most important ones. And so, due to a variety of reasons, which I will not be going into again due to time reasons, these squares represent the uh, rough areas which I have identified as the most likely extents of Pomneni influence in Paphagonia. So, as you can see, I argue in my thesis that it's quite a broad area. So, now let's quickly look at the Turkmen and Turkmen invasions in Babylonia from the 1040s onwards. So, they begin in the 1040s, these sort of incursions of Turkmen forces. So, our sources for Babylonia from this earliest period consist of uh, the lead correspondences of Michael Selos and John Lauropos from Ephaita, uh, and also various other auxiliary documents. And these indicate that um, in the 1050s, uh, sorry, does some warning has come up? Is this? It doesn't affect people. Okay, I'll just. Uh, so, uh, sorry. So, yeah, these documents indicate that in the 1050s, Catalonia was slowly becoming an area threatened by uh, Turkmen raiders. It was felt as unsafe. So, the picture we get from these letters is that there's a sense of unsafety. And also that this looming threat is recognized by the Byzantine intelligentsia. Uh, so in the course of the 1060s, various strategic strongholds in Eastern Patagonia began falling to the Seljuks, among other Turkmen groups such as neo Caesarea and Amasya. Patagonia evidently was to become a frontier zone once again after 200 years. And evidently after these strongholds began falling, Routes A1 and A2 especially open up to invading forces with the lack of loss of certain strongholds. The diffusion of raiding elements becomes quite prominent through the 1070s. And then it is also likely, just as an extra addendum of information, that Romanos Diogenes, who was marching on his way to his eventual defeat at Manzikert in 1071, 
went to Apollonia, so possibly groups A1 or A2, because um, A. Sorry. So, yeah, a dedicatory inscription to him in Sinop implies a nearby passage through this area, and it does make sense in the sort of road networks that we've seen. So, the aftermath of this battle really sort of dismantled the Byzantines. Byzantium's eastern defenses, more so than the battle, of, battle itself, the sort of civil war which followed it. Now, the 1070s and 1080s, so 1071 to sort of 1090, is when Paphlagonia really becomes an arena of contestation between a variety of state and non state actors. So, this is a period which is very complicated, uh, I would say. Uh, so, turban raids and ambushes are attested in a variety of sources as far west of Nicomedia. As you can see in the map, that's basically in Mexico, in 1073. <clears throat> also in Heraclea in 1075, Castamon in 1075, Sinop in 1070s, Ankara fell to the Seljuks in 1081, for instance. But what's maybe more interesting is around in 1075, uh, the Norman. Sort of showed us that the contestation of this area became more than just between Byzantium and Turkmen forces. Now, the Danishman Nami Epic, which reportedly narrates events from 1071 to 1085, it obviously is an epic. Uh, so, yeah, it gives us some more information on this. Uh, so, in this epic, many Pathogonian fortresses, <clears throat> most notably Gangra, Neo Kayseria, and Kastamo, are given as completely on the Danish man with control. And obviously this is an epic written centuries later describing these times, but it is sort of corroborated from the other sources which we have seen. So the red area here is kind of a rough extent of areas under the Danish man with control in this period from these sources. Uh, so this is just a brief illustration of Alexios Omnenos' group after he captured Ruselius in Amasia. So he Instead of returning to Constantinople directly via routes A1 or A0, he decided to take a northern detour to visit his ancestral homeland of Kastama. Here, he suffered at the hands of Turkmen raids and, and uh, underwent an ambush by Turkmen forces. So, him and his contingent had to flee through the forest of Paphlagonia, we are told. These forests are most likely the west central forest of Paphlagonia in this region. They fled to Heraclea, where they were ambushed again by Turkmen forces, and then had the tail of Constantinople because of this. So, just to show his life route. Uh, so, coming <coughs> to the end of this section, we have another snapshot of this region in very detail from the Lombard Crusade of 1101. So, this is an incident narrated from multiple perspectives, most notably from the Byzantine side, Anna and from the Latin side, Albert of Aachen. And what we see here is that this crusading contingent aimed at Syria decided to first go to Neo-Kaiseria to liberate Bohemond, who was being held there by the Danish bandits. And what is notable is that even though Bohemond had been captured down south in Melitene, he was being held in Neo-Kaiseria, kind of implying that this was a stronghold of the Danish bandits in this period. Now, both Emperor Alexios of the Byzantine side and Albert of Aachen warned the crusading contingent to not travel through the Paphlagonian interior, so to not utilize routes A1 or A2, and instead take the coastal routes due to the dangers inherent. The crusading army was this and travels through Ankara to Gangra to Kastamon. All of these locations are described as being under firm current control, and they suffer various sort of setbacks in each of these locations. Then eventually in the stretch of land between Kastamon and the From this narrative, you can imply it was being under a heavy Turkish control. And then, according to the reports, not many survivors are left from this, obviously, but a handful of wealthy knights, etc., managed to survive and uh, run to the coast to two port cities still controlled by Byzantines, uh, Fulgaral and Sinop, and then they sail back to there. So, this map sort of illustrates that throughout all this period, as you can notice, the coast is 
being to, is still under Byzantine being controlled in many of these coastal strongholds. There were some reports of attacks in Sinop, but in general, Byzantium continues to retain control of the coast, and this is very important for this period in accessing these other areas. As you can see, the interior is sort of a, a dangerous terrain. Final image we get of Paphagonia is from the 1130s, the campaigns of John II and Nenos. And I want to quote John Kinamos here, who, while describing Kastamon in the year 1132, refers to the Turks who dwelt there, and then going, goes on to say some other thing. So the way he said the Turks who dwelt there will not really sound in the context of when he said it as if the Turkish presence there was recent or tentative or or weak. You know, it sounds like they had kind of settled there and they've become a recognized center for them. And then John John's campaigns, Emperor John's campaigns, uh, corroborates this when in the 1130s, for instance, Kastamon fortress is conquered twice in 1132 and then in 1134. So it was lost then in between immediately. And then after 1134, it was again immediately lost. Um, and then his 1139 campaign, John once again has to take the coastal route when heading to near Kaiseria, because the interior area which he had previously conquered was again all lost in the, spring, in the few years between these two dates. So now I would like to just briefly, quickly go into the pattern in Crimea connection. Uh, so very quickly. So throughout most of the last three millennia, politics in control of the southern shore of the Black Sea, Apollonia, have had some degree of political sway and are direct control over the southern shore of the Black Sea, specifically in the region around the Crimean Peninsula and the Sea of Azov. So can this be a coincidence? This section analyzes this basically. So uh, the Black Sea, so to get into some more sort of geographical details first. Sea currents in the Black Sea effectively divide the sea down the middle, creating two separate circular current paths. Here is a simplified image of this. Uh, this meant that it was possible to travel back and forth from the Crimea to Paphagonia by utilizing the port cities in the Paphagonian region at the level that other port cities further east, such as Trabzon, or further west, such as Constantinople, could not compete with. You can kind of see this from the sea currents. Traveling to Sinop. Traveling from the Crimea to Sinop would take as little as one single day in favor of the sailing sea. <laughs> so, what made these regions in the, in the north so profitable, uh, so important for politics on the southern shore of the Black Sea? In other words, why was this geographical relationship exploited? Uh, so, from the first Greek colonies founded in the Crimean region, beginning in the 7th century BC, to the periods of Roman, Byzantine, Trebizondian, Venetian, Genoese, and Ottoman control in this area. The function of the area was essentially the same. Colonies were directly controlled enclaves situated in the Crimean area, uh, such as Kherson for the Byzantines or Kaffa for the Genoese, facilitated the trade of goods, mainly via the river networks, and the establishment and maintenance of diplomatic relationships with the peoples living in these northern realms. And in this image, you can sort of see this, that the area is, represents a confluence area of several important rivers, such as the Don and Lyca rivers. So I argue that Paphagonia is a trans Euxine province. So what does this mean? It means that, in other words, the hinterland of coastal Paphagonia was the Black Sea Basin, and more specifically, the Crimean, Crimean Azov region. Instead of its landward hinterland <coughs> across the Kure Mountains, which we saw in previous sections I had discussed. Uh, so, Sinop, for instance, as we saw in some of the maps, lies on the on no real major route. The coastal route was not a major route. Um, so it doesn't really have any other function other than being on an important port city on the Black Sea. So that was sort of its main uh, interland, like the Black Sea area. Uh, so coastal Patagonia cannot really be imagined independent from the Black Sea and the Crimean region. It, for all intents and purposes, effectively neighbors these areas. It represents the key to the north, as I call it, and as Nketas David Paflagon also sort of uh, recognizes for Amasris. So, a number of polities, beginning with the Sinopian Empire of the 4th century BC, utilize and I guess you could say exploit this geographical connection which Paflagonia has with the Crimean region. I am mostly focusing on the Byzantine era. So, several important commercial connections. 
Now, I don't want to spend too much time here, but some of the most important trade networks are salt, slaves, petroleum, and grain. Uh, I won't be going into the details of these, but I just want to comment on one thing. So the salt pans in the Black Sea are all located in the north, mostly, overwhelmingly, in the sort of Sea of Azov region. And salt is a very important commodity for preserving fish, which was one of the main dietary components of Constantinople, for instance. So the, it's like feeding the population depending on the salt trade. Um, and then petroleum here is naphtha, which is the, one of the ingredients of Byzantine Greek fire. So it may not have been a, the most common trade ingredient, but it was an important one for Byzantium as a sort of imperial polity. Uh, because the wells which this was extracted from were in the Azov area. Um, so yeah, we have a, several, a lot of different evidence for all of this, like a lot of sigillographic evidence confirming the connections which Patagonian port cities held with port cities in the Crimean region. Also, there's large grain storage facilities archaeologically identified in Amas Christinov and Ionopolis, currently, among others, uh, which indicate that Papagonian ports were utilized as sort of middleman locations for the grain trade flowing between, such as Constantinople and Ukraine. Another important aspect is it wasn't just economic, it was also spiritual and cultural connections. For instance, the, the veto of St. John of Gothia. Gothia uh, involves, so John is born from, in Paphlagonia, from Paphlagonian parents, and then he heads to the Crimea, does various deeds, and then he's captured by the Khazars, and he escapes their captivity, sails to Damascus, and then eventually he, he dies in Damascus, and his remains are sent by St. George of Damascus back to the Crimea for burial, for instance. Uh, so the veto of St. Constantine, otherwise known by his monastic name of Cyril, involves the saint traveling from Paphlagonia to the Crimea to try and convert the Khazars to Christianity. And he fails at this in the end, but nonetheless, this is attested. This is also the exact same route which reportedly St. Andrew the Apostle took in the first century, trying to convert uh, the Scythians to Christianity. And this, even though it's from an earlier period, this is narrated in the Russian primary chronicle of the 10th century. So it's relevant for our period. And then, for instance, St. Pocas of Sinop, a homily on him, I will quote it now. Even the most uncultivated Scythians who inhabit the other side of the Black Sea are singing eulogies and honoring St. Pocas of Sinop. Again, sort of implying this cultural connection. And then a very interesting case, in my opinion, is a Byzantine soldier in the Vita of St. Philaretos. So, this, this soldier, the Byzantine thematic soldier, visits St. Pilaretos and says that he's worried because he blocked his horse and to escape punishment, he wants to flee from Byzantine lands across the Black Sea. So in other words, these northern realms escape, represent an escape from Byzantine authority and Paphlagonian ports represent the gateways to this escape. And then a number of other sort of uh, epitaphs and, uh, and such show some more sort of clergy connections, church connections. Uh, so perhaps the most important connection of this Paphlagonian Crimean connection, which I'm arguing for, was the diplomatic connection. Uh, so <clears throat> some examples from the early history of its Byzantine period are, for instance, the events resulting in the crowning of Justinian II and Philippicos Pardinus, for instance. Both of them utilized this Crimea to Paphlagonia connection uh, using Khazar diplomacy to eventually reach the throne. So we see the sort of idea of king making and emperor making uh, utilizing these routes and the diplomacy enabled via this route. And then the Sarkel incident of the early 9th century shows us how, again, this diplomatic relationship is utilized in the building of a fortress with the Khazars on the Don River. Uh, so I won't be narrating this whole slide, it's not very worthy, but this is just meant to show that from the sort of 7th to the 13th, basically, century, so maybe late 12th century, you should say, the, the diplomacy enabled through Byzantine access to the Crimea, uh, which was, again, largely quite often through Paphlagonian ports, uh, was very important for diplomatic connections, and these were with among others, the Khazars, Pechenegs, Bulgarians, the Rus, and the Cumans, for instance. And more than once, these arguably uh, rescued the Byzantine polity from devastation, we could say. 
some crucial alliances go forward. So uh, this is just a brief slide where um, I won't be going into details, but due to a variety of reasons, I argue for a pre-819 date or for the establishment of the Amaskrian fleet. And this is why it's important, because there is a attested Rus raid to Catalonia, to Amaskris in the 820s, known from certain literary sources, mainly the Vito Giorgio Amaskris. And uh, so all the scholarship sort of had the idea that the, the Russian raid resulted in a Catalonian fleet being established in Amaskris. But regardless of the time I argument I made, that the first recorded raid, uh, Rus raid to Byzantium is to Amastris, sort of speaks to the relevance of the location in itself, I think. So recent uh, archaeological work has also identified heavy imperial investments in Sinop and, and Amastris, for instance, a big fortification process which goes hand in hand with the establishment of the fleet that we just uh, described. And this was on a grand scale in indicating imperial investment. So these areas matter for the Byzantine state. So, and then, yeah, so this is just to show that these sort of connections continue in the post Byzantine period, for instance, with the Seljuks. It is noteworthy that the Seljuks conquered Sinop in 1214. And then, very shortly afterwards, the only naval expedition of the Seljuks, the only naval expedition they conducted, is to the Crimea from Sinop in their history. Uh, so this is just one last uh, sort of just brief look at the Ottoman Empire, and once again I wanted us to just notice that the quality and control of the scene connection. Uh, so the Catalonia Crimea connection was crucial from when the Greeks first opened up Black Sea to sailing in the 7th century BC until steamships began bypassing this current, these currents which I showed through modern technology. So kind of ending important geographic relationship. Now today, if you in, in Turkey today, Amastris and Sinop are relatively unimportant cities, sadly, because this this um, That I've made throughout this speech. Obviously, these are all very tentative points and it's a work of progress. We've seen that several important latitudinal routes run. Settlement and movement patterns are strongly correlated with the security of the region. The Crimea is effectively a hinterland to both of Patagonia. The Pontic Mountains are more of a barrier than the Black Sea. Coastal Patagonia is a gateway to the north, so diplomatic, economic, and cultural projections of Byzantium and other southern politics extend northwards via Patagonian ports. And also, <clears throat> an argument which I later developed in some other sections of my thesis, that Patagonia was clearly relevant for Byzantium, for instance, imperial investment. And this kind of later leads into ideas of a core province. Thank you. Yeah, uh, yeah. And, and I think it gives uh, uh, everyone a very good sense of how critical uh, this uh, serious engagement uh, with uh, geography, geomorphology, climate uh, is to, to any kind of studies, especially uh, a warning to textual people like myself, uh, how uh, the, the travel through this region would be actually in that spring uh, becomes uh, uh, essential for um, uh, for any kind of uh, of analysis. Um, 
to start the conversation, I'll, uh, I'll just uh, throw here uh, one uh, fairly simple question and two comments. Uh, first, with the comments, I love the part about uh, salt. Uh, salt also essential for cheese. Um, and uh, it might be interesting to think about how uh, this emphasis on uh, Crimea becomes more important as Crete, which is also a major uh, uh, producer of salt, you know, from the Venetian uh, era. Um, how those two things correlate? Uh, because I think the, the Byzantine state uh, might have some sort shortages there, but this is very small. Uh, the, the other comment uh, uh, I, I thought that was fascinating, and uh, uh, I've been talking a lot about a book, uh, Fred, on uh, Republican history by Nicola Terenato uh, on uh, social elites uh, in. Uh, in uh, In Paphlagonia and Alexis Komnenos being the person dispatched to deal with Rusellos in Paphlagonia. So the whole notion that the general gets to be in command of armies that go to specific regions is also someone with very specific tie, uh, ties on the territory that can be mobilized for campaigning. So Ternato Greek might provide a uh, uh, sort of uh, comparative uh, point, uh, point for you. Now, there's a very simple question. That we have in the end, given what you've discussed, which is very much about fragmentation and division and the difference between A1, A3, and then uh, 2, 1, 0, uh, and the north, uh, gateway to the north connections, what makes the Plagonia progress, given these very distinct kind of regions uh, within it? I think this is a really great question, exactly something that I've been thinking about myself a lot, considering I divided the Plagonia sort of looking at both of Patagonia and its relationship with the Crimean region very separately from the rest of Patagonia. Initially, I actually thought of labeling the, like maybe not this talk, but perhaps sections of my thesis, like Patagonia and the dual province, this sort of thing, because I think there is a big divide between sort of interior Patagonia and coastal Patagonia. I, I agree, I definitely agree. And I do think that the reason that it, uh, it is a province is due to sort of the political exigencies stemming from Constantinople and not necessarily the landscape itself. So, yeah. So, uh, so it, it, do we then need to go all the way back to Roman conquest and see how provinces are created and what the logic is there? I think this is a great, yeah. Great that's idea. a legacy issue to have. Yeah, this is something I should. Thank you. Um, just thinking through like travel time, what would the average travel time be? like along the coastal route versus maybe the southern route, and then also the sailing time from like a Patagonian port could be primarily on like just average times just to get this. So some of the, so obviously it's hard to, uh, one of the big routes going across Patagonia, it is noted that from Constantinople to all the way to Arsenal, Theodosiopolis, which is beyond Patagonia, but using, passing through Patagonia, basically, it's noted that for an army, it would take about 11 to 12 weeks. But that's an army, obviously, so that's a slow one. For an individual traveler, it's noted as taking anywhere from about 11 days, the shortest of tested, uh, journey, to about a month. So perhaps like two or three weeks on average for an individual traveler. Uh, but it, it, this is a big route. I mean, it is a large terrain. Uh, it's yeah, it's hundreds and hundreds of kilometers. So just the Patagonian region I looked at, I sort of had the scale about the top, but it's roughly a, maybe like a 500, 600 kilometer area I, I look at latitudinally. And then if you also extend that to Constantinople and then further east, you get about a thousand, perhaps, for instance. And then the the sailing route. So as I mentioned, so in favorable favorable weather. Sin up to Crimea could take just a single day. Mm. Uh, the favorable weather, favorable weather is obviously the spring and summer and early autumn seasons. Uh, yeah. yeah. Okay. Um, how was I going to go back to the beginning? Uh, the Halas River is um, the one that Croesus shouldn't cross if he wants to prevent the fall of a great group of any matter. Um, and and so um, 
clearly at that time it represented a border. Um, and it makes me wonder a little bit about um, um, uh, ethnic uh, divisions in this area. Um, it's easy to for us to imagine this uh, ethnic uniformity, but um, certainly they, um, for one reads uh, even Homeric texts, when you have the sense of these peoples coming from various parts of Asia Minor that um, didn't even speak the same languages. And, um, but have, has this all been homogenized by the times in the period that you're talking about? Uh, so I think this is a great complicated question. I don't think I can have better answers, but I do agree that first of all, to the start of your question, um, the Halas River does represent a boundary also in Byzantine uh, administrative divisions. Quite often, it is the eastern boundary of Patagonia. So I, because the the, the sort of definition of Patagonia as a province in Byzantine times changes a lot in different centuries, and sometimes it ceases to exist, it absorbed into other provinces, etc. I kind of looked at a very broad area. Uh, but quite often the Halas is the boundary of Patagonia, so it does still represent a important boundary because it's such a big river in the area, it's the biggest river of what we looked at. And as for the, yeah, I, so I kind of go into this a bit in my chapter looking at identity issues and local identity and stuff, and uh, definitely in sort of the travels of Xenophon, for instance, on this sort of we see this area and the division between the coast and the interior is very sharp, where the interior is much less Hellenized, for instance, and uh, as you say, a lot of different polities, etc. And in the Byzantine times, so I think it's a hard question to describe how much there is there, uh, like a homo homogen identity here. But I do try and argue for a certain uh, extent of Roman identity here uh, during Byzantine times, partly through uh, the presence of the state, for instance, and a number of other factors. But I, I think this is a very complicated question. Definitely. Victor, this was such a fantastic talk. Thank you. Uh, I feel like you really helped me understand what was at stake in, a, in an event like in the 1070s, you mentioned Bristol, the burial, Cicero, and Masia, right? And I think we really understood why it was so difficult to get out of there, why it was so important. And so being able to actually kind of triangulate the geography and the history and the pathways has made that come alive for me in a way that we never had before. So th thank you so much. I've got so many questions. I'm going to try to just narrow it down to um, a couple. One is, um, yeah, I think you're totally right about the pre-800 existence of an Amasya fleet. And I wonder if there's any evidence for its existence, yeah. even as far back as the seven, around the late 600s, early 700s. Nick and just in a second, and his settlement of Slavs in Bithynia. Um, and also, I think we do have a Kumbergario seal that mentions Slavic presence in Catalonia as well. And it's all connected with um, oarsmen for the, the fleet. And it reminds me, uh, you mentioned Philip Lopez Guardanes in his um, you know, rebellion and usurpation. And uh, just in the second, we use Hunter and goes out to Patagonia to um, do something. We're not quite sure what. And it's sort of Philip was comes around from behind and, and sees his Constantinople. Uh, I, I've never been able to make sense of that, but I wonder if he's actually trying to mount a fleet out there and go north. It, it's not terribly, it's very easy as you've shown to sail from Moscow to Crimea. It's not quite as easy to sail from Crimea to Moscow, is it? The currents will make it more sensible to sail to a bit further east, like Sino, uh -huh. and then take the coastal route. Yeah. yeah, I mean, it's, yeah. Right, so I, I would wonder why you know you may anticipate the arrival of, of a usurping fleet from Crimea out in, in Papagonia. Just a thought that maybe there was something more there, maybe there was a fleet already, and he was trying to retool a sort of second expedition to go north when he, he lost his head, as it were. Um, just, just one thought, I wonder if that's anything you could have looked at in trying to establish the, the earlier history of this fleet. Um, the, the second thought, or the second question, goes back to Dimitri's uh, question about what holds Patagonia together as a province, if, if anything, if it's been the weight of Roman history, if there are other connections. And I, I wonder about economic connections between the coast and the hinterland, especially when it comes to timber. Right? I mean, you, you, you talked about uh, the Moscow fleet, we also know of individuals like Michael McConker, right? And his family were famously involved in the shipbuilding industries of coastal Patagonia. And I wonder where they're getting 
the wood for that. And presumably it's, being, it's coming from Africa, the Egyptian maybe, is it coming from across the Black Sea? And if that's the case, do we know of families that, let's say, own woodlands and forest lands in the hinterland and also had presences in the cities and shipbuilding? Or are there those kind of economic connections that help hold this province together as a, as a unit? So, really great question. Thank you. I'll start from the start. Um, so, the incident of Justin II going to Babylonia, while typical Spartanes was in the process of getting out from Kadars and taking the throne, is something I also looked at. Uh, so, in the sources, it's mentioned that he goes there to find out what's happening in, over in Crimea. So, it's sort of the sense that um, because news is entered uh, living in lands through the connection. He's going there to find out, uh, you know, receive news of what the situation is, this sort of thing. But then, yes, as you say, he, he is late to Constantinople when a series of events unfold. Indeed, I think it's an interesting episode. Uh, and then the, for the Amaskian fleet, yeah, I, I just was making an argument of the, the establishment should predate 8, 819. But yeah, I mean, how much it predates that is definitely an open discussion, I think. And Recent archaeological work in Amaskris by James Crow primarily has identified that the fortifications there, uh, the large reef fortification process there, dates post potentially to a much earlier time period, so perhaps like end of the seventh century, this sort of time, uh, eighth century. So this could indeed be much earlier, the eighth century period. So yeah, I think that's a possibility. And then as for the the other question you mentioned, so. Even though Paphlagonian rivers aren't really navigable for humans, uh, they were utilized by a lot to send logs down uh, to the from the interior interior forests down to the coastland where shipbuilding industries were prominent. From the Byzantine times to the Ottoman times, it was also important still in modern Turkish times. So yeah, these rivers were used to send these logs down uh, to the coast. And I, I definitely think the idea of like this industry, looking at this industry more is a, is a great point, I think, and I will indeed look at this because I hadn't really thought of questions of like ownership over the forest lands and you know how much of it is private individual or state and this sort of thing. And we don't know much about that, about uh, ownership of forests. I mean, we know that mines are state operations, uh, or at least there is some degree of control of the state. Uh, you would think that uh, there might have been some sort of a monopoly on. Uh, on, on, on forests, but uh, we really don't have that much uh, evidence. But it's kind of critical, and it is one of the best areas for, uh, for finding lumber or digging. Right. And then also for um, for for pig foraging, especially thinking about work for the fleets, right, and provisioning soldiers as well. So the forest land is this really multi kind of dimensional space, economic space. Um, which at least monarchs in the West are very, very keen on making sure they control virgin forest lands and that kind of those are those are state lands as well. So it, it's we do know very little about it. It's just so exciting to think about the potentials that are were raised by the kind of work that you're doing with it to actually help shed light on all of these different aspects of the economic activity. So I was trying to find the yeah, so in the forest map, for instance, as you say, we can see that it is one of the most densely forested regions that I mentioned. Yeah. Uh, I'm looking for the slide. So here we do see uh, how diverse the terrain is. So as you say, it really does represent many economic opportunities in this landscape because the climate map here, each color representing a very different sort of climate, which means a very different vegetation. Uh, you can sort of see how, how many different sort of yeah, animal husbandry, forestry, all these different things can intersect very closely in Patagonia. It's very interesting. So, uh, have you uh, actually looked at uh, what kinds of uh, uh, trees are available and how they correlate with what we you know about uh, types of trees used in business shipping uh, to make that? I mean, the Patagonians that you mentioned to me, and so I'm intriguing ship building. So, no, this is an avenue I haven't looked at yet, but I will definitely make a note. This is a yeah, great avenue to look at. Yeah. Okay, all right. Um, I would think say if we would delve into um, any of the material records for the region, do you like ceramic records? And if that is something that like supports what you're saying here, I know the, the ceramics from like the GDA region and Eskimani were like a little difficult because a lot of it is local production, so it's not always like the most helpful. But I'm curious if perhaps like some further remains, you know, um, what the ceramic record might say. So I, I did look at look at it. Uh, so the ceramic record is record, especially for the coast, uh, shows us that workshop look.
ceramic evidence, which was been identified to have been produced in, in kilns and stuff in this location, which has been found uh, all across the Black Sea, quite a lot in the Crimean region. Again, showed, providing as archaeological evidence for this Haprobonian Crimean connection, which I was arguing for. So I have not really looked at archaeological material sufficiently for the interior area, I don't think. So this is definitely something I will look at more. So I mainly focused on the sort of ceramic evidence for the sea trade, basically. Thank you. Yes. Um, I was just sort of wondering how do you conceive uh, the connection between Paphlagonia and the capital? And do you think it could be seen as, I mean, the way, you know, if you look at it, sort of, it could almost be seen as this strange kind of extension of the heartland into, into the periphery by this coastal route. I mean, it's always struck me. Uh, how close Heraclea Pontica is to what we think of as, you know, the, the really inner heartland um, of the emperor, empire, and how important you think this maritime route is to not only supplying uh, Constantinople with, uh, with goods and with grain and, you know, other things, but also the human geography. Do you see people uh, traveling back and forth on this route, or or coming out of the east or the west into Constantinople or or elsewise. Yeah, this, this is a really great comment, and uh, I definitely agree. I mean, so I also look at this a lot in one of my other sort of sections of my uh, thesis, where I look at uh, the presence of the state in Paphlagonia and sort of uh, a lot of other evidence also. And I and I do argue that Paphlagonia represented a all province in a sort of very tentative usage of the core periphery theory, theory uh, but more so the point that it was part of the Byzantine heartlands, I, I argued for. And this is uh, very sort of juxtaposed against how it is represented in literary sources. Because Paphlagonia is quite often the object of mockery uh, in sort of Byzantine sayings, stemming all the way from antiquity, some of these things. And uh, another important point about Paphlagonia, is, which I didn't really go into here, uh, is also quite overrepresented in Byzantine high society, of especially the 10th and 11th centuries. Uh, so we have a lot of Byzantine individuals in the court, uh, in the imperial palace, uh, you know, in high positions. And there is there's a great work by Paul Magdalena on this. Uh, so this sort of has been argued to perhaps stem from uh, Paphlagonia's undue sort of over influence in the court, resulting in this sort of mockery. Uh, but all of that aside, I argue for a variety of reasons that Paphlagonia represented a part of the sort of secondary band of provinces. So away from the sort of, sort of Constantinople and Bithynia and Central, yeah. the, the kind of main capital area. And then it's like a secondary band of provinces, uh, Paphlagonia among them, which represent yeah. a kind of part, part of the outer heart and perhaps yeah. you could say, but definitely not a frontier so, uh, yeah. for most of its history. And, yeah. It's I mean, administration, sorry, also yeah. like uh, cellular gravity evidence, etc., also shows that its administration wasn't like a frontier zone. Yeah. Uh, yeah, sorry. Also, just in terms of the, sorry, I just in terms of the, um, the sort of mockery directed towards Paphlagonia, I wonder if that could be because it is, it by far impinges of, of this, sort of, this sort of uh, second ring of, of provinces. I mean, arguably, it impinges closest. Uh, so that might be why they're overrepresented, over overrepresented, and also maybe why in literary culture um, they're not because it's the it's the they're sort of ubiquitous. But they are also you know not not from you know the capital and its immediate environment. So yeah, this is a whole another issue. It's very complicated, I think. Uh, in what I argue, so I think the the mockery is sort of I mean there's multiple levels of the so Byzantine eunuchs, for example, are quite often from Paphlagonia. So this can be an avenue of mockery, for instance. Uh, so it's not just necessarily high society, but also this sort of thing. And also, um, this is not necessarily, I don't think, to do with Paphlagonia being close to Constantinople. It's more to do with a series of events sort of beginning in the 8th century, 9th century, early 9th century region, surrounding the sort of marriage, uh, marriage of Theodora and uh, Mario of Amnia, also earlier than that which sort of begin these kinship links between Paphlagonia and certain prominent individuals in the capital, who are Paphlagonians who go there. And then this sort of relationship continues uh, over the centuries, which 
I try and outline this a bit, sort of how this goes throughout the centuries in, in my work. But we can definitely trace a connection beginning in the 8th, 9th centuries. Thank you so much, that was fascinating. Yeah. Any other questions? <laughs> Sorry, I know you mentioned briefly the various like protective saints. Can you speak a little bit more to that and maybe the spread of the cult of various saints? Do we see them just confined to cities or do we see provincial saints or maybe leaning into collective identity? Thank you. I think this is a, a great question. So I'll just open the slide. I think those slides don't necessarily have much on this in the background. So this is uh, an important aspect I look at in my chapter on local identity because I argue that these local saints represent an important element of Patagonian local identity, regionalized identity. So, for instance, Saint Theodore for the cities, towns of Epaita and Amasia, or Saint George of Amascris. Uh, St. Gregory for Nepaiseria, St. Phocas for Sino, and there's a number of other individuals who represent a sort of civic pride, I argue, for their, their respective cities. But this civic pride extends not just to their own cities, but to neighboring areas and the sort of hinterlands and villages and endurance, and especially uh, some of the saints, such as St. Theodore, become more widespread in the 10th century, for instance, become it picked up by the imperial policy of like a symbol of a warrior saint. But yeah, I, I definitely think these are important elements of the landscape and the, I, with what makes Paphlagonia sort of a like unique as a province. Um, yeah, uh, which, just to pick up on that really quickly, do you see any, thinking about the connection between the Crimea and Paphlagonia that you mentioned right out so wonderfully, uh, are there, can you see the movement of cults between these two areas? I'm thinking of someone like St. Clement as well, who um, has a big presence in the West, but also in Crimea particularly. Um, do you see his cult spreading in Paphlagonia as well? Or the presence of these Paphlagonian saints who have some sort of uh, you know, impact on, on Crimea? So, yeah, this, I think we definitely can say that it, it spread both ways, as you say. Uh, so, I do discuss a few of these instances in my work, uh, but I, I think. This is an avenue which I haven't pursued enough, perhaps, especially the direction from the Crimea downwards. I mainly looked at the sort of uh, spread of Byzantine culture northwards. So, yeah, I think, thank you for bringing this up because I need to focus a bit more, I think, on the other direction, which I haven't really looked at that much. Yeah, right. I wonder if there's a way that if you're standing in Crimea, Patagonia, sometimes it's like Crimea, so it's like rather the other way around. Uh, or depending on where you're kind of what you're looking at. Um, the, the other question I had was um, about these roots in particular. And so it was so interesting to me to see how you, know, you have group A3, A2, A1. And then when you're getting into the Carnelian period, really it's A3, which you make the point of saying is some of the, one of the most least habitable kind of overland ways around becomes kind of the main artery for, uh, for the empire through Patagonia, right? Because these other inland routes, which are much easier to cross over, have been essentially lost exactly. That's the method of design here. Um, and it, it just, this might be a little bit of a, of a reach, but it reminded me of a work, uh, someone's writing a dissertation on a Turkish woman named Joan Shaker, I don't know if you ran into her, uh, on 16th century Lebanon and the importance of new tears in 16th century Lebanon in tra traversing this incredibly difficult kind of terrain, but in some of these really economically productive areas. Now, muleteers kind of become like taxi cab drivers in New York City. They have this sort of collective identity, they're important for sharing news, um, and they become kind of politically powerful as well. So that just made me think about the ways in which when you have imperial control that's relegated to this very difficult coastal route, which is easy to navigate by, let's say, horses and donkeys, but not so much by carts, do you start to see any kind of change in other other kind of air sources, for instance, do mule deer become more important or more present? In, increasingly narrow sort of route that the Byzantines had access to across. Uh, thank you for this. I think it's a great point, and I have not heard of that work, so definitely I will look into it. Uh, thank you for that. Uh, so, yeah, I think this is something I just look into more now that you mentioned it, because as you say, I haven't really looked into the details of transportation means and how they changed over the centuries. I merely kind of just noted that the passage of large army columns through here 
is noted to look be quite arduous and taken a considerable more time had they been able to, than had they been able to use the interior routes. So it's a considerable sort of impediment, but a necessary one due to the security and affordable. But on the other hand, we have other like the Lombard Crusade who ignore this advice and decide to go through the interior and meet their sort of demise. But yeah, I mean, sort of more detail about uh, how it affected transportation and such, I will definitely look into. Thank you. Yeah, and even on a sort of local level, right? If you want to get from Odessa to Sino, suddenly you're you're reliant on you know potentially on different types of transportation routes, you know, yeah. things like that, rather than being able to kind of go on the highway inland. But at the same time, this uh, the other thing. I mean, uh, the discussion that we keep you having in business that is about the mission trade privileges and all that mm -hmm. stuff, uh, knowing that the Black Sea was closed off for all those. You then realize that there is a whole other universe of business and shipping that might be uh, happening there. And the geography of this region basically would support it simply because, well, how else do you move? Mules and then ships and- Exactly, right. So you might have an ecosystem that really did sort of encourages short significant small scale visit and shipping. Mm -hmm. You want a little boat, you get a boat, you go, you know, a couple hours west or east. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, I think this is also very prominent because for instance, the sort of loss of Sinop is in twelve fourteen to the Celtics, whereas I've just been illustrating how the Papagonian interior is kind of kind of beginning began to become lost to in the Byzantines in like the 1070s and 80s. So there's a huge time span between when Byzantium retains relative control of certain coastal port city strongholds yeah. and when the interior was lost. So this would obviously breed an ecosystem of yeah, different transportation. Do you have any, do you have a lot of piracy? Piracy is definitely a bad idea. So this is one thing I, I did this stuff a bit. It's for mainly for the sort of uh, contestation period of like the 12th century when the Seljuks and the Danish Mandates and the Byzantines were all contesting this area. And also when the Empire of Trebizond uh, enters the picture, and it all becomes complicated in that it's hard to define like who is the pirate, like who are the you know who is the lucky piracy here. Yeah. So I yeah. I do have a non line question uh, straight from Alex. Uh, thanks for the talk. Uh, so speaking of negative depiction of the and in literature, could you maybe think? Uh, that for the intellectuals in Constantinople, the region's landscapes and climate corresponded to what they would have learned about the character building of communities and peoples based on the climate theory found in Ptolemy's text and onwards, all the way to Pachimeris. So the climate and landscapes make the people crude and unrefined as per climate theory. I, this is something I hadn't pursued really a line of thought, but I think it's really great. So thank you uh, for this line of reasoning. I do want to comment that in a lot of these sort of ancient uh, descriptions of Papagonia from Homer to Xenophon, etc., we do have an emphasis of its hardy landscape, which is then put next to the sort of barbarity of its inhabitants. So perhaps a kind of similar logic to what you're mentioning. Yeah, we do see. Thank you. Okay, so uh, this was really rich, and I think there's probably still. Uh, Opportunity for a conversation, and maybe we can take that to uh, Spearcraft. But uh, before we do that, I should uh, perhaps uh, uh, formally thank you for a wonderful presentation. Thank uh, everyone who has joined uh, here, but also uh, on uh, online, and uh, ask you to uh, keep looking at our events uh, page for uh, uh, future Hellenic studies. Uh, uh, talks next week, uh, seven o'clock, Seagull Center. Uh, on uh, Wednesday, uh, we have uh, uh, Mr. Hans from Oxford, uh, uh, who will be talking about uh, 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 democratic resilience in a way, aspects of uh, the great crisis from uh, the uh, 2010s uh, and all the way to, uh, to, to our days. Uh, once again, uh, thank you, and uh, see you at our next event.